All right, here we go. Uh, welcome, everybody, to another episode of Make It So Adventures in Spacecraft. Uh, today, I am going to be making copies of existing miniatures from Demon Blade Games' uh, long since uh, discontinued uh, line of miniatures uh, for their game, Rumble in, and Rumble in Antarctica, uh, a game based on. Guar, uh, one of my favorite, very goofy heavy metal bands, heavy metal acts. Um, these miniatures were made back in like 1997. Uh, there was a small line of them made and they've popped up on eBay once or twice a year uh, in individual uh, minis. I purchased one of them many 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 years ago um, at a live show back in like 1997 of uh, Beefcake the Mighty from Guar. Uh, this is this is he. This is a mini I've had forever um, and always wanted to get the rest of them uh, because I'm a big fan of both Guar and of miniatures tabletop games and mini painting and collecting and all of that stuff uh, my entire life unfortunately they are they were cost prohibitive and rare enough that I was unable to find more of them until very very recently when I found a post on a subreddit of a gentleman who was uh, posting photos of his entire collection of nearly every single mini in that line um, this was an astounding collection uh, I immediately contacted him and said, hey, I would be very interested in purchasing any spares that you have, uh, to which he replied, I, I would never sell these, they are my sort of prized possessions, um, at which time I offered to paint them for him. Um, we got to talking, and he looked at some of my post history of some of the minis I've painted and things like that, and agreed to... Uh, to commission me to paint some of his minis uh, and uh, as we got t talking more and more he agreed to allow me to make copies of them myself uh, for personal use. Um, I'm going to be making molds uh, for so that I can make copies for myself of some of these very hard to find minis if possible. Uh, making molds of minis is very very difficult. Uh, it's extremely difficult to capture all of the detail and to get them to come out well. Um, I've already made molds from two of them. Um, this is one of them. This is uh, Balsack. Uh, he is uh, one, or he is their guitarist and has a steel bear trap for a face. Uh, this is a mini that I've painted for him along with a custom base. Uh, uh, meant to represent the sort of Antarctic theme of the game. Um, I made a mold of uh, Beefcake, or of uh, Balsack here. Um, this is the result, uh, the mold. Uh, it's a two-part mold in which uh, you pour your material into the top after you've clamped these together carefully, um, along with vents to allow air and and uh, excess materials to escape. Um, I'll talk through the process of building these um, as we go. Um, I can show you some of the results. They're not ideal uh, that I was able to get from these molds. I'm not super thrilled with them. Um, this is the first pewter cast. You can see that the leg here uh, just really didn't show up. Uh, a lot of air got trapped in this arm so it didn't form at all. Um, one of the most difficult areas is to get sh very sharp uh, uh, details to come out. Uh, these are spikes that ended up being very very rounded off. I apologize we don't have it super sharp. Uh, when we get into mini painting and detail stuff we'll have a, sh a closer angle to, to view. And then uh, his axe just completely failed to fill. Uh, this was cast using pewter. This is a high temperature resin, uh, and I'll, I'll go into the details of that once we actually start pouring molds. Um, I also used a resin, and you can see I got uh, somewhat better results. The arm 
came out fully the uh, parts of the axe came out um the horns really didn't come to a spike you can i don't know if you can see but there's very they're very much rounded off because air was trapped in there um but i got somewhat better results i also have an additional copy right over here or somewhere well you'll have to take my word for it i don't see where it went um that i used uh for initial paint tests for the mini uh, it was incomplete similar to that one um, but i managed to get decent enough results from it that i could go in and start testing the paint before i did it on the the original pewter mini um, so today uh, i'm going to be doing a couple of different minis uh, i've got all of them in here these are the minis that I'm going to be trying to make copies from. And I'll go through them as soon as I've got them laid out. These are all the pieces that I'm going to be trying to make copies from. Um, and we'll see how many molds I'm able to actually finish uh, today. But the models that uh, I've, I've got out here, uh, this is uh, a very rare version of their model that they made of Odorus Urungus. Uh, portrayed by the late great Dave Brocky, uh, frontman for Guar, uh, as well as a sword used for this version of, uh, of Odorous, in which he's holding it uh, suggestively in front of him. Um, I, the first mold I made, the sword didn't come out particularly well, so I'm going to try one more time before I end up painting and reattaching it to this. Um, the gentleman who commissioned me to do the painting uh, for these minis was kind enough to and had a spare of that and sent me a spare but it was missing the sword so it's important to me that I can get a good copy of that for my own display and we have two different versions of Slyminstra Hyman who is a female member of Guar uh, this is her primary model um, along with her uh, her mace uh, accessory that normally gets glued in just like so that she'd be wielding as well as a very rare version of her portrayed as the god Kali or Kali or however it's pronounced uh, along with a number of accessories uh, she has a ring of fire that attaches to her back like so and then a chalice of blood that attaches to her uh, hand, to one of her six arms and then she's riding atop a squirming and screaming guar slave just like so um, so I'm going to try to make copies of each of these uh, the accessories the sword the mace the chalice of blood and possibly the ring of fire i'm going to try to make copies of in a single mold and then the other will get their own individual molds just like so um i don't know that i've got enough material to make each of these um all in one pass but we shall see all right so first steps here I'm going to set this over here. I need to get a hot glue gun set up because uh, the hot glue is what we're going to use to attach the walls of the mold uh, to the material, to the board. Uh, this is just a piece of uh, countertop plywood. I forget the name of the, the surface here, but I've found uh, in the past that it tends to work well for mold making. Uh, it's relatively easy to remove the material from here once you're finished. Um, I'm going to get the hot glue gun plugged in so that it can warm up while I cut some uh, foam core for the walls of the mold. 
get some extra glue sticks set up here. And if you're uh, joining us in chat, feel free to ask questions. Um, I will do my best to check the chat and answer any questions as we go. Um, I will also be uploading the final uh, video in long form up on YouTube and will potentially set up edited uh, shorter versions of it that I narrate over the top to give a bit more concise, uh, detailed versions uh, of uh, the process here. Excuse my shaggy gray, gray head. We are smack dab in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic and quarantine, and I have not had a haircut since long before it started. All right, so I've got some leftover, just plain old foam core here. And this is what I'm gonna use for the walls of the mold itself. It doesn't need to be particularly thick the mold itself uh, you can see here um, that's more than enough uh, so we're looking at maybe an inch and a half total depth. I've got a ruler here and then I'm going to use a white colored pencil to make the marks on the on the black foam core, just because it makes it easy to see. Uh, move this out of the way. I'm just gonna measure off about an inch and a half high line on this foam core. And then again at three inches, again at six and a half, and again at eight, and that I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. One and a half, three, four and a half, six. Yeah, my math is much better there than it was on the other side, but they should like it fine. And then use my metal ruler to scribe the lines, and then I will use an X-Acto knife to cut them. Oops. You can use any number of materials for the edges of the molds. I use foam core because it's relatively cheap. I had it on hand, it's easy to work with, and uh, it's thick enough and yeah, easy to, easy to use. Um, grab an X-Acto blade. Or a hobby knife. Actually, we use this guy. This is one. Uh, this is an ergonomic blade uh, that for or handle for craft knives that I picked up from a Kickstarter years ago. Um, it works pretty well for doing nice long straight cuts. Not as much for doing tighter detail stuff, but for this, it's perfect. So I'm just going to go ahead and cut these. With foam core, I like to do them in two smooth passes. That should be enough. Again, this really doesn't need to be precision. All we need is walls high enough to gather all of the clay and silicone that we're going to be using in. start with the accessories and I'm going to try to line them up hmm you know what I'm gonna put this guy right in the middle there so this is the general layout that I'm going to be working with it's gonna be a relatively wide mold um, just taking a quick ballpark measurement here it's about 
four, let's say four inches wide and maybe two and a half tall. That works out pretty well. These guys are seven. So how about four and a half and two and a half? Does four and a half give us enough? Oh yeah, more than enough. Perfect. Okay, so then I'm gonna slide these out of the way. And I'm gonna take two of these and I'm gonna mark them at two and a half inches in, which should give us four, two and a half and four and a half so that I can use that to build a box. This is making me wish I had a smaller ruler handy, but I don't. So you make do with what you got. Now, um, as I'm cutting this, um, or prepping this, the molds, or the copies that I made that had uh, poor results uh, in resin, um, <clears throat> one of the things you can do to eliminate some of the bubbles, or at least minimize bubbles, is to use a pressure pot. I do not currently own a pressure pot, but I just ordered one, so hopefully by uh, this time next week or so, I should have one here. Um, I can hook it up to my compressor uh, and we can use that to do some tests of the molds to see if we get better results. Uh, put this back up. The pressure pot basically allows you to take uh, and place your your molds and with your uh, material in it as it cures uh, and forces any bubbles that are in there to be so small that they become virtually microscopic and helps push the silicone down into every extremity. So with any luck, I'll be able to make uh, resin copies of uh, from those molds that come out in much better condition and then I'll have those, uh, or I'll have copies of these that I can keep and display in my own collection, uh, which I am very excited about. All right, so I'm just gonna make very shallow cuts on this line, um, being very careful not to cut all the way through because I'm only trying to be able to bend these pieces. Because these are gonna be the corners of my mold and I'm going to take them like so, use the hot glue to glue them down around where I'm going to be making my first mold uh, and then we will fill this with clay. Uh, so as I had mentioned, um, we're making two-sided molds. Um, if I was to make a single-sided mold, these miniatures would be <clears throat> basically trapped inside, virtually impossible to get back out. Uh, by making a multi-part mold like so, we can separate uh, the the mold, but in order to make this, we need to fill this uh, box halfway up with clay, uh, and I'm going to be using a polymer clay. This is uh, Jolly King brand plastiline clay. This is a uh, non-sulfur based. Uh, this is actually a wax based clay uh, that can be used over and over again and will not react with the silicone. Silicone tends to be fairly uh, chemically sensitive as it cures. Um, so you want to make sure that any clay that you're using is uh, compatible with it. Um, um, as we're waiting for the hot glue to heat up, I can explain a few more things about these molds. One of the important things to consider is where you're going to be pouring in your material and where, how the air is going to get out. Uh, a lot of these have uh, like these arms here uh, we're gonna be pouring this upside down uh, just like so so a lot of the the air will travel theoretically should travel up and out uh, but areas like this the bottom of the mace that she's holding these spikes that are, are pointing uh, uh, upward. Um, anything that's pointing upward uh, has potential for air to get trapped in there. So as much as possible we're going to want to have uh, overflow lines or vents that allow that material to escape out. Um, with the accessories there's 
uh, like the ring of fire, all of the fire points for the most part stick down, but they also tend to stick off and there's a lot of risk of those areas not filling part particularly well. Um, I'm also going to be placing the, uh, the goblet in the center of the ring of fire. So we're going to need ways for the material to flow from here to here and back out and then fill around. Um, so I'm going to be using some uh, wire. This is 22 gauge wire. This should be thick enough to allow materials to flow through, especially if we put them into a pressure pot, uh, putting them into uh, uh, putting resin or not resin, but uh, pewter into these is a lot trickier, as you can see by my pretty awful failed result from from that. But we'll we'll do our best and give it a shot, um, and we'll do the casting process in another stream. Um, it looks like the hot glue gun is getting just about hot enough, so let's give it a quick test. It's looking good. All right, so I'm going to put a very generous amount of hot glue along the bottom of this. You don't want to be shy, but we can always reinforce it, and we will. Uh, and then I'm going to put this as close to a 90 degree angle as I can, somewhere in view of the camera, so you can see as we work. Uh, and then do the same thing with this. Oof, that's very hot. Um, and then I'm going to make sure to get the edges here so that we can make sure that we get a good bond between the walls. Just like so. Very nice. Very nice. All right, I'm going to let that cure for a second, grab an extra stick, and then I'm going to go around the edges. Uh, actually, no, I don't need to go around the edges. I just need to make sure that these gaps between them are filled so that once we pour in the silicone, it's guaranteed to not leak through. Um, I said I don't need to fill the bottom here because since we're making a two-sided mold, the bottom half of this mold is going to be filled with clay. So the, the glue that I put along the bottom face, excuse me, um, is just there to help adhere this to the base and make sure it doesn't move around. That should do it for that one. And then if we're going to do one more mold, which one should we do? Um, I'll bet that we could get a good mold of Kali and the slave all at once. So let's try that. Um, so for that, we're going to need approximately the same height, but it doesn't need to be quite as wide. You know what? We're overthinking this. Let's do one first and make sure that we do a good job of that one. So this is going to be for each of the accessories. Again, that's going to be the sword, the mace, the ring of fire, and the goblet. I'm going to do one last test here. So just make sure we've got more than enough room and we've got plenty, plenty of room. Excellent. Good. Okay. So, I'm going to take these back out, set them back up here just to remind me of the layout that we're working on. Um, one of the other things that we need to uh, keep in mind when we are setting up this mold is how the material is going to flow from the top down. Um, I like to use cutoffs from previous sprues. Um, I've got one uh, previous sprue here. This is from a 2005 Games Workshop uh, box of skeleton warriors. Um, I'm going to be cutting off pieces from this mold, uh, from this sprue here, to basically just reuse this shape uh, to, to give me my top uh, basically gutter up here. So the, the material will be poured into the, the top hole here and then run into this line and then down into the mold uh, through a number of cuts and openings that we create. 
uh, using wire and things like that. Uh, so we'll cut those here in just a little bit. First we need to fill our mold with our clay. And you can see the remnants of the Bossack uh, mold in this clay that I uh, used before. Again, the beauty of this clay is it can be used over and over and over again. So um, you buy it once. Um, I've had this for a number of years. Um, it's a wax-based clay, so it's pretty temperature sensitive. Uh, it can be a little bit hard to work at first, but you just roll it in your hands and it'll start softening up and you'll be able to work it in no time at all. All right, I'll be right back. I'm just gonna check that everything on the stream is working well. getting a little softer. So we're going to fill this mold about halfway up uh, with clay and then we'll embed our pieces into it and then we'll go in and do some very careful sculpting along the mini to make sure that we get it exactly where we want it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the theory behind that stuff here momentarily. I'm just going to press this stuff in with my thumb for now. Um, if you have questions about the process or any of the other sort of projects or pieces of projects that you see on the desk too, feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to explain. So it's going to take quite a bit of clay to fill it. Keep working this stuff here. this will be right back. sculpting tool here to help flatten this out a little bit, make sure that we get a nice base to work in. We still got quite a ways to go. Alright, 
it's starting to fill up nicely. I think we'll probably still need this chunk. Got a piece to fill here, back here, and in this corner. And I'm just going to use my thumb. Peel this off before it gets in the way. Uh, just like so. Nice smooth base to work with. There we go. A little more. Hey, we got some some folks hanging out in chat. We got Kusmer and Alaro. How's it going? Um, so to catch you guys up, I just got the walls for my mold uh, glued down to my base here. Um, I'm going to be making a mold for uh, four accessories for these miniatures. Uh, this is the Ring of Fire and uh, Goblet arm extension for the Kali version of uh, Slymenstra, the female uh, singer for Guar, uh, as well as the sword for Odorous, the lead singer uh, for Guar, and the mace for the regular uh, version of Slymenstra. Um, I need to make copies of each of these mol or these parts of these minis uh, for my own collection uh, before I can start painting them for the commission uh, that I've got. Um, so I've created a box here with hot glue and foam core, and I've got some, uh, this is Jolly King brand plastiline, uh, non-sulfur based, uh, it's a wax based clay that I'm going to be embedding these miniatures in. So I'm going to start with the Ring of Fire, like so. I'm just going to take these and very firmly but carefully, so I don't warp the mini, just embed these into the clay itself. And then I'm going to place, well, hmm, how do I want this one to work? Uh, if you look at a lot of minis, especially older minis like these pewter ones, you can typically see a flash line uh, or a mold line about halfway down the mini. These are are certainly older minis before the technology for them had, uh, for making these had improved to the, the point where it is now. Um, what, now we can use 3D printing to create multi-part molds and do all kinds of amazing stuff. But back in the day, these would be hand sculpted um, and then molds would be made. And you can see that it's in a pretty flat, sort of symmetrical pose so that the mold itself would have a relatively flat line of travel around the edge of the mini. And if you study the mini itself, you can typically find where they made that uh, that line. It looks like this was made about halfway up uh, the this little goblet here. Um, so that's going to be where I'm trying to embed uh, the m mini Two. I'm going to take it from the original creator, uh, the best line of action for the mold to make sure that it separates and flows well. Um, so I've got those in there. Um, I'm just embedding them by hand, but I'll go in with some finer tools to get a better, uh, more careful line afterward. Uh, next I'm going to embed the sword. Um, I had a hard time with this one last time. Hopefully we get better results with this because this is kind of my last chance to get it molded. Um, actually, we've got quite a lot of additional room. I might be able to get... You know what? I'm going to try for this slave mini as well in one... Oof. Am I pushing my luck with this? Yeah, probably, but... Mm, that one's going to be so tricky. Um, I say that mainly because uh, if you look at this, the way that his knee is kicked back like that means that it hangs well below the rest of the mini and it's going to make it a real challenge. Yay! 
Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna play it safe with this one and just try to do these accessories. Um, but I do have a lot of extra room here. That's all right, that's all right. Okay, so embed this guy down in nice and firmly. Uh, so your question, why is non-sulfur based important? Uh, silicone tends to be pretty chemically sensitive uh, when it's curing. Um, silica, or sulfur is a uh, additive to a lot of different types of clays. Um, like um, I think that there's some sulfur in Fimo and some of the other oven baked clays um, along with a number of other uh, uh, types. Uh, it tends to prohibit the curing of silicone. So you always wanna make sure that when you are making silicone molds, you look for a non-sulfur based clay. Um, I got a lot of my mold making materials from Tap Plastics and just asked them, hey, what do they recommend? And they had some of this stuff on hand. I've had this stuff for years and you can use it over and over and over again. Um, uh, and I've used this for many, many molds. So uh, I would highly recommend a similar plastiline clay like that. All right, um, so now that I've got that, in, I need to very gently start working around and moving the clay around that same line of action uh, where we were going to have our mold release. What I'm trying to avoid also is silicone getting down underneath the 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 mini um, and creating uh, allowing it to float because then uh, once I try to separate this, it's going to make it very difficult to get a nice clean line of separation um, and potentially very difficult to even get the original piece back out of the mold, meaning I may have to destroy part of my mold that I spent all this time working on in the first place just to get it out. We definitely want to avoid that sort of thing. Um, it's not critical that the rest of your uh, area is flat and in fact uh, um, when we go through and start setting this stuff up, um, we'll, uh, but before we pour our silicone, um, we'll actually add in indentations and registers uh, to make sure that the two sides of the mold uh, lock together really well um, and give us a nice clean cast. So I'm just going to very gently keep squishing in this clay. This may not be the most riveting part of this view. It's mostly going to be a view of my hand, but I'll keep trying to check chat if you have additional questions. Um, that's interesting that sulfur-free plastiline is what you needed for bronze casting too. Um, uh, I, were, hmm, I, I don't know why that would be. I've never done uh, bronze casting. I'm not sure what material you're building the the mold itself from. Um, were you making your original out of the sulfur-free clay? Or did you sculpt it and then embed it in a uh, uh, plastiline? Um, yeah, I'd be curious to find out more information about the uh, that that process and what they made the molds out of. I'd be surprised if they used a silicone for bronze. I believe bronze tends to get pretty hot and I think a lot of the molds that they use are plaster based, which I don't think is particularly sensitive to uh, to sulfur, but I'm certainly not an expert um, and it would certainly sound like they were trying to avoid any chemical reactions or uh, prohibition for the curing by using plastiline. I just like working with plastiline in general too. It's it's a very nice, easy to work with clay um, and it's wax based so it tends to soften up easily when worked and then harden back up uh, when left alone. So you can get nice clean detail and nice smooth areas without a huge amount of effort. All right, that's actually starting to look pretty good already, but let me make sure that the inside here 
is in and then our next step once we get this embedded and our mold line established is to start running wire to create our vents and additional channels for our materials to flow and to allow air to escape. Uh, that sword is already looking pretty good. Oh, that's interesting. So you were doing a Lost Master uh, version. Um, uh, Kusi was saying that uh, the class she was taking, um, the original would be uh, plastiline, and then the plan was to burn it out of the mold. Uh, that You do that a lot with uh, Lost Wax casting, where the original mold, is, or the original uh, sculpture is made out of wax, uh, and then is embedded in uh, plaster or some other mold making material and then a very hot material like bronze can be poured in uh, and it's so hot that it burns off the original wax. Um, you can also use that as a secondary step where you create your material out of uh, you know whatever other material, styrofoam or clay or wood or things like that, make a mold and then create a wax copy because wax is much easier to work with and reuse, reheat, and um, and just cheaper than bronze, safer to work with than bronze. Um, and then you can make multiple copies of those, make a, uh, a master or make a mold embedding that in there and then fill it with uh, with your hot material like a bronze to create multiple copies of your original master uh, just losing the wax versions in the process. Um, I've also seen that done for some metal casting where they use uh, styrofoam for the original sculpt because styrofoam is cheap and very easy to work with. Uh, I've seen it for making cast aluminum versions of things like swords and uh, other props where they embed that in sand and then pour in the hot aluminum and it'll burn off the styrofoam um, and the sand will keep it in place um, and then you end up with your nice master uh, or your nice copy. Alright, so now that we've got these embedded in place um, I need to be adding in runners or channels or vents for our material to flow. So I'm going to be using a uh, 22 gauge red wire for um, allowing some of this to run around and then I've got a mold from or a uh, uh, an old model kit sprue uh, from a games workshop skeleton warriors uh, model set or miniature set that I'm just going to cut apart and reuse these sprues uh, for my top runner here because they're nice and straight and I know material will flow well through them because that's what they were designed to do in the first place. Um, I need it to be... actually it lines up pretty well with the three sprues that are on there but yeah if I cut to about here cut this guy off I can embed it like so. This guy needs to get cut to about here. Yeah, this is a great way to reuse empty sprues. Um, I've I've seen other uh, uses for them. Some people are absolutely crazy and will go through and cut these into little bricks and make entire little sculptures and walls and stuff like that or rubble out of them for sci-fi minis they can work pretty well for pieces of rubble to look like beams and stuff like that um, but I mean you start collecting models like this you're going to end up with so many of them that you know keeping a couple of them around is more than enough for uses like this uh, okay that actually works out pretty well I still need to trim these down a little bit further and I'll move the camera here in a second so you can get a better view of what we're working with. Um, it's going to go in like so. 
This guy's going to need to get cut pretty much all the way down. And that. Great, well, this Demon Blade Games miniature is going to have a Games Workshop inside the mold printed in there because, well, why not? All right, so I'm gonna unhook the camera. I apologize in advance for the motion sickness you're about to get. Uh, but I wanna give you a quick view of what we're working with. So you can see that they're embedded pretty deeply in there, about halfway up, and I've gone through and sculpted carefully to the edges. And then I'm embedding this, and then I'm gonna cut, after I finish the mold, a area in about here um, where the silicone will go in and the, or the uh, the material will go in and then flow through uh, through the entire mold uh, but this is basically my primary channel for distributing or distributing the the material around all right there we go lock this back in and start cutting myself some pieces of wire for some additional runners. Make sure, make sure this gets embedded properly. So we know we're gonna want material to be able to flow to the centerpiece, and I'm thinking that it flows from here to there, and then from this tip down and then probably from these little drips popping out, I'll run back out to here, and then maybe another one there for good measure to make sure that it's got lots of avenues for it to flow through. Um, when working with uh, materials like um, pewter, which is what uh, this failed cast was uh, was from, the first one tends to fail a lot because it gets temperature shock. As you pour it in, it cools and hardens almost instantly and then prevents additional material from rushing past it. Um, I found that your second and third mold tend to work a little bit better because it's sort of preheated the mold and you get a little bit less of that temperature shock. I've also tried preheating the molds in a little toaster oven I've got out in my garage uh, when I'm doing metal casting. And that seems to help a bit as well um, for that first run at least. Uh, but when working with uh, resin, you've got fewer of those issues to worry about. Um, I'm going to grab a pair of tweezers here. Uh, and I'm going to just bed this into the clay. This is a little bit too long, so I'm going to trim it again. Get a little bit better clippers for more precision on the cut. These are still pretty narrow, but material should be able to flow through, especially if it's a thin material like a resin. Um, I still don't hold a huge amount of faith that I'm going to get good pewter copies, but I'm going to use a high temperature silicone to uh, see what I can get. Curve this a little bit and squish this right in. I'll use a tool to help embed that. Actually, I'm going to drop the a little bit further on there so that it's got more seating in the other side. That was one of the problems I had with the last one is I kind of over filled along the sword since it's so thin. I wanted to make sure that I had a good copy but when I tried to put it in the other side it there wasn't enough material to really hold it in place so some silicone got around it and I ended up with these really bad lines running down the middle of the mold. All right so there's that first piece. Second. That should give us a nice channel. And we'll require a little bit of extra cleanup on the tips of the flames there once we get the copies out. But a little file and knife should make short work of it. All right, and once I get these things in, I'll go in one last time with my tools to make sure I've got a nice clean edge because I'm going to goof it up a little bit with the tweezers and wire and stuff like that. I 
units are too big. All right. So, everybody been enjoying, if you're up in the Pacific Northwest, enjoying the sunshine today. It's actually got so warm that I got up early, got a bunch of yard stuff done, and then got too warm and ended up retreating into the nice cool basement for the rest of the day. So, how's everybody else doing? You woke up to snow in Ohio? That's wild. Yeah, for some reason it's like 85 degrees here in Seattle, which is super, super unusual for this time of year. Montreal, wow. Very well, okay. So now we've got plenty of ways for material to get in and out of that goblet in the center of the ring of fire. I'm gonna add a few more pieces uh, to go from, there's these little tips on the side of the hilt of the sword. I'm gonna try to run one up. Uh, probably to the tip of this flame, kind of an S channel along there, and then another one from this side over to the mace. So there's lots of ways for it to flow all around. And then from the tip of the sword over to the tips of the flames here, probably from the top of the mace up to the top of the sword, just to give it lots of opportunity for material to flow down and through and not just get stuck in here and just basically giving it lots of ways to allow air to get out of the areas of the mold that we really want to maintain. Um, so let's start with this part. Is this, that should work. Bend this a little bit more. Uh, let's see. That ought to work. So I'm going to go from the tip of the spike on this mace. Oops. Uh, make sure to embed this at least halfway down into the clay to this part on the sword itself. I'm probably going to need to go in and clean out a little bit of that silicone with a knife after the mold gets made because it's not making perfect contact, but that's okay. Um, but that should give us a nice flow. Um, I might do another one from here over to there. Let's do that. Cut myself a little more wire. And this is just standard electrical wire that I've had for goofing around with electronics and stuff like that. But honestly, you can use anything. Uh, wire just happens to work well because it's not too thick. Um, but I've used toothpicks in the past for for making channels like this, uh, you could use, like I use this old sprue for doing my primary channel. It doesn't really matter as long as it gives you the shape that you're looking for and a way for material to flow and air to escape. Because it's all about trying to get rid of the bubbles. Nice thing about if I can get a decent pewter cast is all of this extra stuff that's not the parts that I need can be remelted for future use too so um, it's a highly highly recyclable material uh, I'll need some more to go from the top of the sword to these tips of the flames I'll probably do another one over to there and then um, I'm going to want more ways for it to get back up to the primary channel and the air to escape back out um, and I'll move the camera back over so you can get a better view once I get the stuff embedded in. You know what, I'm just going to go a straight line from there to there. So it'll hit both of those tips and the tip of the sword. Smart, smart. Actually, I probably want to go from here up to. All right, I'm going to need some more. Just like so, to about there.
run from there up. So about that much. We're getting real close here. Once this is done, um, I need to go through, kind of detail the mold or the clay again, just to make sure I've got all the bits I need as clean as possible. And then I will add my registers, um, just some dents into the clay to make sure that the two halves lock well together. You can see examples of those here. I literally just took the end of my sculpting tool and just mashed it into the clay all the way around so that when I get both of my bits of mold, it makes sure that it, these two halves don't slip. And then one more run right there to go from the end of the primary register, or primary channel, back to the flame and to allow air to get back up. I'm going to want one to go from here to there. I need that S channel that I talked about earlier. I'm glad you find it fascinating, uh, False Gamer. Um, if you have questions, let me know. I'm more than happy to, to answer. Again, I'm only making copies of these minis for my own use. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying to do this for commercial use one because you'd be making money off of other people's art which is super not cool two it's real real hard to get decent quality copies of uh, minis and the likelihood that you're going to get something that is going to be of commercial value and quality is not great and if you're trying to pass off counterfeit versions of these on the market that's uh, pretty shitty of you so don't do that um, but these are incredibly hard to find minis uh, that I was lucky enough to get my hands on and was commissioned to actually paint. I can show you some of the other copies again here once I get these bits of the mold made um, to show you some of the the results of the, the painting and the guy who commissioned me to paint them was cool enough to let me make copies of them as well uh, but that was something I made sure to ask permission for first uh, because these are are his then it's not my property to begin with and if something were to happen that's a lot to trust me with these are you know on eBay these can run for you know 50 to a hundred dollars a piece I mean, he's got a very very rare collection here but primarily don't try to make money off other people's art like make your own stuff um, this also, you know, this process isn't exclusive just to minis. You can use this with, you know, anything you want to make a copy of in resin or in pewter or any other material that works well in the molding process. Um, I've made, uh, I can actually show you here momentarily, uh, pewter copies from a 3D printed original. Uh, that I made a two-sided mold exactly like this process that came out nicely. Um, actually, I'll go grab one of those. Yeah. So these are pewter uh, spaceship copies of, uh, of a 3D printed version of uh, the logo for the company I work for, uh, Very Very Spaceship. Uh, easily the coolest little game and art studio that I've ever had the uh, wonderful fortune to uh, take part in. Um, one of our artists made a version of this logo and 3D printed them. Um, I brought one of them home, made a mold just like this, and poured uh, pewter in. And I've made, uh, I think, probably eight or nine, maybe ten copies of it so far. Um, the molds won't last forever. Um, they, you know, it's silicone. It's a relatively soft material, and it will take damage every time you make a copy from it. But um, you can also, you know, make your own sculptures and things like that. And do single-sided molds are much easier than doing the two-sided mold. But uh, 
they can be a lot of fun to, to do things for like medallions or coins or uh, any number of things that uh, don't have a lot of intricate detail um, and would be easy to remove from a flatter mold. Okay, um, so I'm gonna grab the camera. We'll get a little more motion sickness going here real quick, but give you guys a better detail shot of what we're working with here. So you can see, the idea is that um, I'll cut a big hole here where the, uh, I apologize for my hands are a little bit shaky. I did a lot of weed eating and stuff like that earlier today out in the yard. My arms are still kind of shaky from it. Um, uh, we're gonna pour in our material here and it's gonna flow through here into the voids that are left when we remove our originals. And then the wire is there to create additional channels where air can escape and, ma and the material can flow down through. Um, I think I may add an additional channel right here and here to get down it because this is such a small area and a small little neck for it to flow into and I worry that it's not going to flow all the way through. Um, and actually I may do one from here as well because if you think about this would be upside down and air would get trapped up in this little bit so having a channel that runs maybe here and then off to there that's it. that'll do it okay that's the plan right, so Seafalls Gamer says uh, purchased some of the, the Hearst Arts mold years ago for making plaster terrain bits um, uh, yeah those are great I've got a number of the Hearst Arts molds and that was sort of my first introduction to casting uh, was buying those molds um, and then I started doing some additional sculpting actually I've got some on the, the desk right here uh, I did some sculpting and some 3D printing uh, to make masters to make additional dungeon tiles for uh, from those um, let me move this space marine off these are uh, pieces of dungeon tiles that I uh, created from 3D printed masters. I downloaded the originals from uh, Thingiverse that were free to download and to make your own 3D prints. Um, and this is a modular sewer tile set um, that's designed to be used with, uh, I think it's the Open Forge system, uh, the Open Tile system, something along those lines. Uh, but they work uh, really well with two by two tiles uh, like you may see from uh, Picorni or uh, Dungeon or uh, uh, Dwarven Forge, things like that. But I made single-sided molds uh, where basically I just glued these down to a piece of wood just like this um, and built a box around it. I didn't need to use the clay since it was just a single-sided mold and then poured silicone directly on top. Uh, and then once that silicone cured, take the, the box off, uh, peel the silicone off and then remove the originals and I could pour in. This was made out of uh, dental plaster uh, and this was a uh, resin that I've got um, that cures in like 10 minutes. It's really nice stuff. Um, it's the same stuff that I used here um, on the mini mold um, and I was able to make tons of copies from those. Um, I also ended up using uh, polystyrene or st pink styrofoam, insulation styrofoam, to sculpt additional walls that could go around those and made a single side mold from that as well. So that rather than having to make each tile by hand, I could make one copy or I could make one master and then make copy after copy after copy by pouring in uh, either uh, plaster or, uh, or resin. Um, and it's super easy to paint afterward. I've got some painted sets uh, floating around here uh, that work great. All right, I've got a couple more channels to make. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I want to go from there to there, from the tip of that spike down. So this is a little bit too tall. All right. Oop, a little bit more, shave it off. Make sure that we've got an escape route for the air out of that spike so we don't just end up with a flat ball on the end of the chain on this mace or flail. 
a nice little small piece so that we can run some additional material easily between the two, between this channel and the sword. And let's cut this down about in half. Just like so. Do one more right there. So not a lot of the materials that I'm using here are particularly expensive. The clay was probably still have the sticker on it. It was like maybe 10 bucks, 15 bucks. And like I said, I've had that clay for years. I've used it over and over and over again. Uh, this chunk of clay that's in the mold here has probably been used for at least half a dozen molds in its lifetime, and I'm sure it'll be used for plenty more in the future. Um, and the silicone is easily the more expensive stuff. Uh, I'll show you the stuff I'll be using here shortly. Um, uh, but it tend, I order that, uh, you can get it from like Tap Plastics or some other suppliers. Uh, this stuff I was actually able to find on Amazon since a lot of stores are not currently open thanks to COVID. You stupid virus ruining everything. Uh, but um, yeah, there's all kinds of different materials. There's some great YouTube channels uh, available out there. If you look up um, like Adam Savage has tested. He's worked with uh, Frank Espolito or Espo Espolito? I think that's his last name. Um, who does a lot of uh, mold making um, and can talk a lot uh, and does talk a lot about the different types of materials uh, that he uses in his mold making. Um, it's used in special effects and stuff too. You can look up a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, Yeah, and Sea Falls Gamer said it can't really complain too much. Uh, still been able to work a job from home and been painting more minis while in quarantine than in the previous five years. Easy. That's super true. Um, you know, it's genuinely something I tend to wrestle with a lot. Is uh, I am unbelievably fortunate to one live in the Pacific Northwest, where I have access to good tech jobs, which is kind of my specialty. Um, I love making games uh, and am incredibly, incredibly fortunate to get to be part of the very, very spaceship family or tribe or cult or not a cult, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we are able to work from home and it's, it's certainly given me plenty of time to, or more time to be home and focus on hobbies and taking care of my house and being with my spouse and, and things like that. Um, and I try to remain mindful and grateful for that opportunity, um, especially in light of the fact that I know I am easily one of the privileged few that can say that. There are a lot of people in this country and across the world that are not remotely as fortunate that have either been out of jobs or been furloughed and are waiting for their opportunity to go back or unfortunately have been forced to go back to unsafe jobs where they're paid far 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 too little to do jobs with far too few safety precautions and things like that um, so uh, you know I try to balance my gratitude and guilt um, and look for opportunities to support small businesses in ways that I can. Uh, like earlier today, I mentioned I had ordered a, a pressure pot um, from a small business um, and was just browsing around on YouTube and found uh, this great band called uh, the Red Elvises um, or Igor and the Red Elvises that I've always loved that were doing a live stream and managed to toss them a few bucks. Uh, in their virtual tip jar as they were streaming their show um, because especially like performance artists and things like that are suffering extremely hard right now um, as basically every theater across the world is shut and touring artists can't really make much of a living um, so it's you know I try not to dwell too hard on 
the the sort of feelings of guilt that come with this weird quarantine um, of you know but it's important to at least acknowledge the the privilege and one you know wonderful gifts that you do have and find ways that you can you know support those that don't have all of the the fortune that that you may have uh, especially as we go through crazy times like this um, you know I say you don't want to dwell too long on the guilt because it's important to take care of yourself as well and allowing yourself to kind of succumb to the the guilt and stress and depression isn't helping anybody um, it's just making things hard on yourself uh, and makes you less able to sustain yourself and to be able to help others if the opportunities arise so take care of yourself Sipal says uh, next door neighbor uh, makes a living uh, creating custom jewelry pieces purchased a watch and necklace uh, from him in the past couple of weeks just try to try to help him out that's awesome um, I've got a bunch of friends that uh, do a lot of stuff through Etsy um, that do jewelry work or other custom art and stuff too and they've certainly taken a hit um, it's nice being able to have a independent art uh, like that but uh, some of them also do a lot of their sales through uh, uh, commission sales through stores and things like that that just can't be open so any ways that we can help supplement them um, even gift cards and, and things like that can be super useful um, and help people weather the storm uh, when we don't have a whole lot of assistance coming from other areas unfortunately okay I think we are just about finished here um, so I'll give you guys one last view of the mold up close apologies for the more motion sickness there we go so you can see there's lots and lots of channels for the air and material to flow through and escape um, we'll be pouring into here and I'll cut multiple holes in the top I'll have a primary vent in the top up here and then holes that I cut over here that are additional vents to allow material to flow in and then through and then back out so that the air can escape but this should give us everything we need and hopefully then some uh, so next we got to make some silicone so let me pop this back into the tripod let's clear some space um, so yeah I'm just gonna do the one mold today um, we'll make copies of these others here on another stream or offline so I can show some other stuff on the next stream but these guys are getting put safely back into here so that they don't get damaged set that off camera do a little bit of cleanup because making this silicone can get a little bit messy all right so give me just a moment feel free to ask questions i'm more than happy to assist or answer them as i uh, clean stuff up off camera here uh, oh i didn't unplug the hot glue gun no wonder it's been so hot set this off camera these tools here for now the rest of the clay all right so to make the silicone that we're going to be pouring in um, we're going to need a few different tools uh, and I just realized I don't have my gloves so I'm going to have to run in just a moment and grab some because this gets real messy uh, the stuff I'm going to be uh, the the silicone I'm going to be using is uh, Mold Max 60 from Smooth On. Um, this is a very high temperature uh, silicone rubber that uh, uh, you can uh, use it for uh, temperatures up to like six, seven, eight hundred degrees. Uh, pewter tends to melt at around five to six hundred degrees, so um, it tends to work. Uh, this works really well uh, for that kind of stuff. Um, I don't have a vacuum chamber to pull bubbles out, unfortunately. Um, that's on my wish list of tools and materials for the future, but 
that's all right. Um, so this is a two-part uh, epoxy uh, that we're going to be mixing by the silicone. Um, it, the mix ratio is 100 of part A to three parts of part B. And I've got another kit over there that I'm going to be using. Uh, so I'm going to be mixing that in here. For a mold of this size uh, of pot part A, I'm going to be looking to use uh, probably about 100 grams or so. Um, I might go a little bit more. Uh, 133 grams would give me three gr would need four grams of uh, part B so maybe that's what I'll do just to be safe because it is pretty wide all right I'm gonna run and grab some gloves I'll be right back And then I've got my part B. This is a very, very thin uh, blue liquid. Uh, and this stuff is kind of like rust red. Uh, so it makes it easy to tell uh, how well it's mixed. The cure time on this stuff uh, is 24 hours and the pot life is about 40 minutes. So we'll have 40 minutes to be able to stir and pour um, before it will start to, to set and lose some of its uh, viscosity, I think. Um, I think it's the word for it. Uh, and then uh, it'll take a full 24 hours for it to cure before we can remove it and make the second part. So we'll do that on a separate stream. All right. So this one is mostly empty, so I'm going to start with that. Um, I've got my scale here. Power on. And it is teared out. Switch this over to grams, and it's set to zero. Perfect. So I'm going to want uh, 133 grams of part A, and then four grams of part B, because it's at a hundred to one or a hundred to three ratio. So this one's almost empty, so I'm going to use up the last of it. There's not a lot left. See how much I can even get out. That's okay. Yeah, I don't know that I'm going to get a whole lot out of this. I probably should have just tossed it. The nice thing about this stuff is it's relatively non toxic doesn't off gas harshly, doesn't stink or anything like that, so I can do it here in the basement without having to set up a fume hood or anything like that. Um, there's a lot of resins that are similar, but there's a lot of resins that are much nastier, um, and I would not try to do them indoors. All right, yeah, so we're getting about 27, 28 grams from there. That's not bad. Uh, it's, oh, yeah, with the stick, about 35. So we need about 100 grams more out of the other one. Let me toss this one. All right. We're just about done here, guys. Sorry, I keep using guys as a general term. I don't mean to use gendered terms necessarily, but it's just a bad habit of mine. I don't need to make assumptions about genders. Let's think of as the royal guys. Uh, okay, so that's at 96. We're looking for 130-ish. There we go. 133 on the nose. Nicely done. All right. Chuck that. Oh, these gloves are already nasty. All right, so 
So then we're going to tear, reset the scale back to zero, and then we're looking for four additional grams of part B. Nice and slow. One, two, three, four. There it is. All right, so I'm going to set that here. Move the scale off of here. And then stir. So um, I want to make sure that this stuff gets super, super thoroughly mixed because any parts that aren't well mixed won't cure properly. We'll end up with real nasty soft spots that end up just being sticky and gross and may potentially ruin our mold. So, uh, Alexa, set a timer for four minutes. Four minutes, starting now. So, I don't have anything in mind to vamp about for four minutes. Do you have any questions? Otherwise, I'm just gonna stir this stuff over and over again. You guys have any projects that you're working on you want to talk about? Um, I mentioned I'm going to take this stream and also uh, add it to my YouTube channel um, over at, uh, I think it's youtube.com slash rank and file probably. Um, just search. I don't think I've got a whole ton of videos up there at the moment, but um, and we may add some of this to our the uh, very very sh uh, spaceships public access channel as well sometime in the future if we decide that this is decent enough content to do that with. And stirring like this with little sticks makes my hand hurt. Good times. Uh, so what company are the rare minis that I'm working with on this? So the, the minis are uh, discontinued uh, line from De Demon Blade Miniatures. Um, I'm not making them for them. Uh, this is a long, long, long defunct line of miniatures uh, that were based on uh, characters from the band Guar, uh, the intergalactic heavy metal alien shock rock band uh, that especially when I was a teenager I was a huge 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 fan of um, in 1997 they released uh, in partnership with Demon Blade Miniatures a game called uh, Rumble in Antarctica that uh, they uh, created a whole line of minis of their characters from um, I bought one of them at a show and then had always wanted them uh, for myself um, but never could afford them because I was a poor little punk rock kid uh, back then um, and then they you know only printed a very small line of them they sold out and have only basically been showing up on eBay once or twice a year for like 50 to 100 dollars a piece uh, so I was commissioned uh, by a guy who had a collection of them uh, to paint his and he was kind enough to allow me to make copies uh, from his originals um, and is actually allowing me to keep a couple of his spares. I'm also looking for uh, to uh, find a 3D sculptor that uh, may want to add a couple of additional characters to the line because um, I'm going to be building out an entire uh, diorama base to for him to display them on and stuff and we wanted to add some of the penguins from the that era of Guar <coughs> from the, the penguin attack and all of that stuff. Um, the whole base is going to be themed around Antarctica and I could show you some of the, the finished bases here after I finish pouring the silicone. Um, again, like I said, I'm only making these for my own personal collection, not to try to sell or to counterfeit uh, versions of them on on eBay. Uh, the, the gentleman who I uh, who commissioned me to, to make these was actually fortunate enough uh, just this last week to find the one mini that he didn't have, uh, the character Cardinal Sin uh, on eBay and managed to get it for a, a pretty good price and apparently it was directly from 
the good folks over at uh, Demon Blade Minis that were selling uh, some of their old stock. Alexa, stop. All right, so we've been stirring this for four minutes straight. Throw this stick away. Now, one trick with uh, pouring silicone is I'm gonna try to pour it um, in a corner far away from the uh, from the model itself um, so that bubbles have time to work their way out uh, from it. And I'm gonna try to pour it from as high up as I can in as thin a stream as I can. So it tends to go really slowly um, to also try to force as many bubbles out as possible. Since I don't have a vacuum chamber to pull all of the air out of this, uh, that's sort of the poor man's method. All right, it's coming very slow and I can see all kinds of bubbles already popping and working their way out. Ooh. So I'm just gonna hold it like so. A nice thin stream and let it flow right over. This part takes more patience than I tend to have. But I'm gonna try to do my best and not mess with it. Let it do its own thing. Uh, Seafalls Gamer says, I did a YouTube search for rank and file and I see a channel, but it looks like the most recent upload was three years ago. Uh, that might be. Does it have like a bunch of like 2D animation and 3D animation stuff that's of middling quality? Um, I haven't uploaded anything to YouTube in ages. It should have a, I think the, yep, that's it. Yeah, it should have a little orange logo of a D20, I think. Um, yeah. Um, now that I finally have a streaming set up down here, and again, since I'm you know, fortunate enough to be relatively protected from a lot of the quarantine, it's giving me plenty of time to focus on hobby stuff, so I hopefully would like to share a little more of my crafting uh, here on Twitch Live and then upload those to YouTube for archival. I just realized I should have added a mold release agent. Um, I have a can of, uh, funnily enough, called Stoner Rocket Spray um, that was also recommended to me uh, and I purchased at Tap Plastics. As from what I can tell, it's like a silicone oil, um, uh, but it tends to work really well as a release agent. Um, and it goes on super, super thin and it's not crazy toxic, so I could spray it here in the basement. Um, I didn't add it, so these things might be a little trickier to get out. Uh, they're all relatively shallow, so I don't anticipate a huge amount of problems. I think the hardest part is going to be getting this stuff to release from the walls. This is a relatively porous, kind of matte finish black paper on this uh, foam core that I used for the walls there, and I think that it's gonna be pretty tricky and want to cling to the silicone pretty hard, but that's okay. We've got enough room along the edges that we can cut it away if we have to. All right, now that I've got a pretty thick layer here, I can pour a little more generously. That's gonna help push the silicone to seep slowly over the rest of it. You guys see okay? I'm working on building a web app for my little procedural music making program. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm going to have to go run and make dinner here real shortly after this. Basically, we're going to finish pouring this stuff, and then I'm just going to walk away. That'll be the end of, uh, of this round. So... Oh, don't let me forget, I'll show you some of the the painted minis that I already have, along with the custom bases that I'm making for them. Um, I think, since this stuff's going to take 24 hours to cure, I might do a uh, uh, another video later tonight on how I make these uh, bases for them, because I need to make a whole bunch of them. Oh, what's up, bombs? 
How are you doing, bud? Still kind of upset at how good my show name is? I know, I'm, I'm clever and smart. Just a shame about my looks. Hey, don't give me crap about that. I know plenty of people that are plenty smart and definitely not very clever. And I know plenty of clever folks that are dumber than bricks. But they can still make me laugh. Oh, this takes forever. So it's starting to get pretty low here. I'm going to grab another craft stick and just start scraping this crap out. Letting it flow out over these minis. Blurp, that probably was way too much and is not a smart thing to do. But I never said I was clever or smart, so. Can't hold me to that. Seafall says, uh, haven't seen Grey Knights in forever. I actually don't have any Grey Knights. Um, I'm not sure which ones you're seeing there. I've got a bunch of Space Marines and Plague Marines out on the table. Um, but I don't have any Grey Knights. Oh, but talking about Alara building a uh, Grey Knights army. Um, Alara, have you played uh, uh, Kill Team? I am a huge fan of Kill Team. Um, it's 40k, but you only need to have like half a dozen minis or so. Um, you don't need to have some thousand point army or more, um, which is great because I don't have the patience to paint a hundred or two hundred of the same mini um, or of real similar minis. I like to spend uh, my time just painting a few and building a collection. So I've got I've got enough minis now that I've got uh, squads for uh, Plague Marines, a um, couple different loadouts of Space Marines, Tau, uh, a couple different ways to run Orcs, uh, what am I forgetting, um, Necrons, uh, the Tech Priests, whatever they're called. Um, yeah, that's I am a big fan of the skirmish style games. Um, even back in the day, uh, when like ninety eight, ninety nine, uh, Games Workshop used to have a skirmish game called Gorka Morka, that was all orcs, uh, lit, driving cool old vehicles and stuff like that around um, this desert wasteland and fighting over scrap and building their forts. Um, that had a whole campaign system that I absolutely loved and still love. Um, it's one of my absolute favorite skirmish games of all time. I still have all the rules for it and a bunch of the models and stuff like that. And I would love to see uh, the success that Games Workshop has seen with their skirmish games come back to supporting some of the other weird sort of skirmish uh, specialty games that they had. Um, I know that there's still a lot of love for Necromunda out there, but um, and which I think came out around the same time as Gorkamorka, but I don't think Gorkamorka was nearly as successful is a real shame because orcs are definitively the best objectively and an entire game about Mad Max style orcs in a desert wasteland is objectively the perfect game and if you disagree then you're wrong all right that's basically it Oh yeah, Speed Freaks. Uh, so Speed Freaks is kind of similar. Uh, the vehicles for those look so good though. Um, I've got one of them, the ruck truck, buggy truck thing uh, that I need to get around to finishing one of these days. Maybe we'll do that on the stream sometime too. Um, it's so good, but it's not nearly as cool as Gorka Morka. There's not a whole campaign system the way that it was set up. Um, 
oh, I a Gork and Bork video game, pitch it at my game company. I, I, I have pitched it at every company I've ever worked at um, and will continue to do so. I've, I, for years, have been filling design docs with how it could work. Uh, it's one of my all-time favorites. All right, we're basically done here, though. Um, as promised, I was going to show you some of the finished versions here. So these are two of the uh, characters from Guar. This is uh, Balsack and uh, Odorous Urungus, the lead singer. Um, I'll move the camera in a little bit closer to give a good view of these guys. Uh, these are finished ones that I painted um, and I built custom bases using translucent resin to uh, uh, allow the, to, to create this sort of ice effect. Um, let see if I can hold this still enough without getting silicone all over it for you to get a decent view. Um, yeah, baby, motion sickness. Uh, but yeah, so these are, are the finished ones. Uh, the sword that is in this mold uh, is uh, what will go into Odorous's hand right here. Um, and on a later stream, I'll be making some more of these bases. Uh, I'm showing the process for um, how I poured in the resin and created this ice, a broken ice effect and embedded pieces of minis in there and stuff like that. So. Anyway, uh, this has been another episode of Make It So, Adventures in Spacecraft, in which we made uh, one half of a silicone uh, two-part mold. I also didn't put in registers for this one. Damn it. This is a lot harder to do when I'm having to blather and talk the entire time. Uh, that's okay. We should be fine on this one. Um, thanks for hanging out and watching, um, and I will uh, catch you next time. I'll make sure to tweet out next time I'm uh, getting ready to do it, and might even do some more later tonight. So thanks. Uh, have fun. Be safe out there, and see you next time.